What a way to start our time together. You can go ahead and be seated, and uh, I want to welcome you today. My name is Chris. I'm one of the pastors here. Thanks for joining us uh, this morning. I know that today is kind of a, has become a holiday in our culture, right? Super Bowl Sunday. In fact, I saw a post, uh, someone had said, uh, man, what's with the fireworks going off last night? And someone replied and said, uh, it's Super Bowl Eve. Like it's legit a, a new holiday for us. Um, and so I always like, I know that since our beloved Broncos aren't in the big show that uh, I always like to see kind of where we're at this morning. So I'm just going to take a quick poll. How many of you are going for the 49ers? All right, raise your hand. Yeah, all right. You're excited? Okay, good. How many of you are going for Taylor Swift? <laughs> okay, okay, hold on. I, I know that uh, I might have just offended some Kansas City fans and Taylor Swift fans. If that's the case, I just want to say, you know, no matter what happens today, here's what we know is we know that the, pair, the players are going to play, and we know that the haters are going to hate. <laughs> and if you got offended by any of that, or if you don't understand any of that, just shake it off. Don't worry about it. Just shake it off, uh, and we'll pray for you. Okay, so anyway, here we are. Uh, week two of our series called End Times, Are We There Yet? Now, uh, this is one of the questions that is on the forefront of most believers' minds throughout the course of the last 2,000 years. And uh, the question, are we there yet, is a great question. Uh, one of the things, if you are a parent and, and you have young kids, especially, one of the favorite questions that kids love to ask, like every time they get in the car, is what? Are we there yet? And, and uh, I got so tired of trying to answer this question for my kids and trying to like uh, guess about how long it's going to be. And so I just started saying this. I said, we're not there, we're here. And it kind of caught them off guard and like stopped them for a second. I'm like, no, but dad, how much are we there yet? Well, no, we're not there, we're here. If we were there, then we would be here, but it wouldn't be there anymore, we'd be here. And then they would kind of stop and look out the window, like just like a glitch, and then they like think about something else. It was great. So parents, uh, use that. That's a free one for you today. Use that. We're not there. We're here. And it's the same when it comes to uh, the end. Are we in the end times? Absolutely. We've been in the end time since Jesus was here on earth. Uh, is it here yet? Well, we're not there. We're, we're here. We're here today. Now, who knows when it's going to be coming, but, but we don't know that. In fact, nobody knows that. Everybody tries, even though we don't know that, everybody tries, every generation uh, since the reign of, or since Jesus was on earth uh, has tried to figure it out, right? Every generation has thought, okay, this is it. I mean, you think about um, the... Uh, the first century church watching uh, Jerusalem be destroyed and, and turn on fire, like uh, put on fire, like this must be the end. I mean, you for fast forward 2,000 years, not counting all the other world calamities that happened, and, and then we have World War I, like this must be the end. We have, then we have World War II, this must be the end. Right? And then in the, in the 80s, uh, there is a guy who is a NASA, uh, NASA rocket scientist turned prophecy sort of student, uh, Edgar Wisenant, who wrote a book called 88 Reasons Why the Rapture Will Happen in 1988. And then when it didn't happen, he wrote another book in 1989 explaining why his math was a little bit off, and so he made more predictions. I mean, who knows? I guess it was a good way to uh, uh, sell books. But, but the thing is, is that we've been trying to figure it out uh, since Jesus was here, but that's not the point. The point is not to scare us. The point is not to, as much as I love timelines and calendars, the point is not to try to decode things and, and try to put calendars in, in place and, and put a chart up so that we know exactly what's happening. We don't. God wasn't clear about it. He was clear about other things, and he gave us clarity in Scripture about other things. This he's just not clear about. So there's a lot of room to think about it. We encourage you, study it, find your own opinions about where you land, but it is sort of an open-handed issue when it comes to the end times. And so what we're doing is we're looking at the book of Revelation. Now, this book of Revelation uh, is, is what it sounds like. It is a revelation. It is a revelation of Jesus. It's a picture of Jesus, who he is and what he's like. And the whole point of Revelation is for us to fix our eyes on this revel, uh, revelation of Jesus. And so here's a layout of what this series 
uh, is going to look like. Last week we started with an introduction. Pastor Matt did that. If you missed it, man, I'd really encourage you to go back and watch that. It really is a great uh, sort of starting point for this whole series about how we're going to do it. Today, we're going to be looking at the throne room. We're going to be in chapters 4 and 5 of Revelation. Next week, uh, we are going to be covering a lot of the frequently asked questions about Revelation. Uh, uh, If you have questions about Revelation, most likely it's going to get answered or close to being answered next week. And so pray for Matt. He's got a lot to do uh, between this Sunday and next Sunday. Uh, And then week 4, we're looking at what is the beast. Uh, Week 5 is Babylon. Week 6 is the new heaven and new earth. And I just want to encourage you again, we're, we're, we're asking everybody to, to be reading through the book of Revelation along with us. You know, it's 22 chapters. We are, we're doing it in six weeks. So there's going to be things, there's going to be parts that maybe you wished we had preached on or, or covered more in depth. We're just not able to do it all. So we're asking everybody to just read along five chapters a week one chapter a day, and you uh, that will keep you <clears throat> uh, up to speed with where we are at each weekend. And so today we're going to be in chapters four, to four and five. If you want to turn there, I would invite you to do so. Uh, but before we dive in to chapters four and five, I have to set it up uh, with uh, a little bit of context. You see, in chapters two and three, John actually begins to write direct messages to the seven churches that the letter of Revelation was written to. Those seven churches were in Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardin, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. And the reason why he's writing to these churches is because each of these churches have different issues, different things that they had let sort of seep into their church culture, into their teaching, how they, how they conducted themselves, what they thought about God. And, and so he, he covers things like the false teaching that they've allowed, the immorality that they've allowed into the church and celebrated, worldly priorities, uh, abandoning their first love, losing their passion for Jesus, <clears throat> idolatry, syncretism, syncretism, is, uh, is when people worship Jesus, but then they also worship other things. They just sort of like mix it in, like, a, like their morning latte. Like, oh, Jesus and a little bit of this and a little bit of that. This is what was going on in the setting of the book, when, when the book of Revelation was written. So to really understand why this was going on, we have to understand the bigger picture, which is the Roman Empire, also known as the imperial cults. You see, the Roman Empire was not just a governing uh, government, it was, it was a cult. Why? Because Rome was viewed as the kingdom without an end, and Caesar, or the emperor, was viewed as God and worshipped as God. And this was in front of them all the time. It was on their coins, it was on their buildings, it was uh, banners and signs and everything in front of their faces all the time, promoting this message that Rome is the kingdom without end. And the emperor is God. And so the fact that Jesus is king of the universe was sort of in direct opposition of the imperial cult. And so uh, they they really thought that it was the end. I mean, just think about like this experience of living under this crazy oppression. And so as a result of this pressure, the church either faced terrible persecution or amazing benefits. Here's what I mean. They either denied or complied, right? When they denied to follow uh, Rome and, and this, this cult that was, uh, that was being forced on them, when they denied to worship Caesar, they would face imprisonment, persecution, uh, poverty, uh, beatings, and, and death. I mean, you name it, you faced it if you denied it. On the other hand, uh, you were invited to comply, like if you joined them, if you submitted, if you, if you, uh, if you pled your allegiance to Caesar, you were promised the, the, the Roman uh, dream, not the American dream, the Roman dream, right? Which was a white picket fence, a peaceful life, 2.5 kids and a dog. And I mean, this is what you were promised, wealth, prosperity, peace. And so you can imagine the tension that the church is facing, the, this difficult thing right in front of their face. And what happened is the church, <coughs> excuse me, the church had a serious case of the look downs. You might be wondering, what do you mean, Chris? Well, let me say, like, if you're ever climbing a tall ladder or you're climbing a tree or you're climbing a rock face or whatever, what does the person on the ground yell up to you to try to encourage you? What do they say? 
don't look down, right? And it's like, hey, thanks a lot. You're like safe on the ground. I'm up here dangling off a tree. Uh, thanks a lot. But, but here's the thing. There's actually truth to it. Did you know that, that there's studies that show that when we have uh, an aroused or heightened emotional state, that our height perception actually gets all distorted, that we cannot actually tell. That's why when you look at something from the ground, it doesn't seem that high. But then when you get up there, you look down and it seems like it's a million feet. Right? This, is, this is an actual true fact, how our brains work. Back in the 1600s, a man by the name of Father Louis Hennepin uh, was the first European explorer to document Niagara Falls. And uh, when he was there, he sees this amazing picture. They go up to the top of the falls, <clears throat> and he looks down, and, he, and as he's documenting it, he writes, uh, the, the Niagara Falls are at least 600 feet high. Well, turns out they're nowhere near that. About 160 feet is how tall Niagara Falls are. Well, it turns out that, that this man, Father Louis Hennepin, was actually de deeply afraid of heights. And so when he's at the top, his depth perception is totally distorted. But here's the truth. When it comes to these heightened emotional states that we can find ourselves in, like the church was facing during this time, it can actually distort our understanding of reality. It can it? It can distort our understanding of what's really going on. You see, these seven churches in Asia Minor, their perception was distorted, and, and maybe for us we can ex we can relate to that, right? I mean, what are those things? What are those things in your life that cause you to look down? What are those things in your life that 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 cause some 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 big emotional response, and as a result, like everything is distorted? You know what I'm talking about? You know that state where everything, the world seems upside down, even though it's not. Like you, th this thing seems like an impossible situation, even though it's not. Like like what are those things? I mean, for some of us, maybe it's the fear of what's to come. Maybe it is the fear of the end times, or, or the unknown of tomorrow. Maybe it's that bad health report that you got from the doctor, the financial problems that just continue to pile up. Or may maybe you think about the way our country is going, or, 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 or you're afraid about the, the, the upcoming election. Maybe bad choices that a family member is making. Or maybe the things that, that get your focus and your attention are things like comfort and pursuing wealth and success and prestige. Like, what are those things? Here's the thing is that these things might be important things. Like they might be good things to care about uh, our, our parents who have the bad health report or whatever it might be. The problem is that when they become the ultimate thing, when they become the ultimate thing, the thing that I need in order to be okay, what happens really and what happens subtly is that they become idols in our lives. Now you might be thinking, wait a second, Chris, I worship Jesus. I don't worship idols. I don't have any statues in my house that I bow down and worship in front of. But, but here's, here's a new way to, or a different, a helpful way to understand what an idol is from Tim Keller. It says this, an idol is a functional savior. Why do we lie or fail to love or, or break promises or live selfishly? Of course, the general answer is because we are weak and sinful. But the specific answer <clears throat> is that there is something besides Jesus Christ that we feel we must have to be happy, something that is enslaving our heart through inordinate desires. You see, when it comes to idol worship, it happens subtly. It happens slowly, like small little shifts in our heart. Just a few weeks ago, my uh, son, Jackson, has been getting into more into fly fishing with me, and so we bought him some used uh, wading boots that you have to wear when you're out wading in the rivers, but these boots needed some new soles uh, on the bottom, and you can buy new soles and replace them, and so I ordered some online, 50 bucks, and, and uh, a few days later, what showed up on my porch was this big box, way bigger than what uh, they needed for these little soles, and so I, I get this box, and I bring it inside, I open it up, sure enough, not only is it the soles that I ordered, but it is a brand new pair of fly fishing wading boots sitting here in my living room. It was about $150 difference from what I ordered uh, and what they sent me. And immediately, immediately my heart was starting to get pulled. You know what I'm talking about? Like immediately I, I start to, to rehearse it in my head. Like, come on, it's a big corporation. What, what's a, one pair of boots going to hurt them? 
Like, come on, it's not that big a deal. Like, they're the ones that made the mistake. Like, come on, I, I, I'm gonna, I could put these boots to good use, and they're not even going to blink an eye about it. No big deal. But then I had this, this sort of realization where I was like, okay, hold on a second. Like, what is reality? What is my heart yearning for in this moment? And if it's anything other than Jesus, I need to, I need to stop. And I, and I did. I asked, okay, what is the right thing to do? The right thing to do is I need to call them. So I did. I called them, and I tried my best. Like, hey, I know you guys made a mistake. What I'm hoping you'll say is, hey, it was our mistake. Enjoy the boots. I, I literally told them that. He goes, well, that would be nice, wouldn't it? But I'm sorry. If you would send them back, that'd be great. So they sent me a, a shipping label, and I sent them back. And part of me was just a little bummed. But then I stopped, and I remembered, like, okay, I think I did the right thing. You see how, how easy it is for our hearts to just sort of micro shift away? You see how easy it is to get a case of the look downs where, where there's a reality that we're supposed to be living our lives under the truth of who Jesus is and, and how easy it is for us to, to lose sight. And what happens, the best thing that we need to do when we lose sight is to get our focus back. And that's the setup for chapters four and five because John is then brought into this vision of what is really going on. So immediately, God gives him this vision, and it's really, these two chapters and further are full of really imaginative and figurative language. If it helps you to close your eyes as I read verses, please do that, don't fall asleep, but, but just uh, close your eyes and try to imagine, just imagine for a moment what John is seeing, okay, as he reads, as he writes these words. In chapter four, verse one, after this, I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven, and the first voice, which I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet, said, come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. At once, I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne stood in heaven, with one seated on the throne, and he who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Carnelian. And around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. Around the throne were 24 thrones, and seated on the thrones were 24 elders clothed in white garments with golden crowns on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder. And before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was, as it were, a sea of glass like crystal." It goes on here in these next few verses to describe uh, these four living creatures with all with different faces and eyes all over, kind of weird uh, imagery. But, but what happens, what we begin to see is this tsunami of worship that comes to God. It starts with this in verse 8. It says this, And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings and are full of eyes all around and within, and day and night, just imagine this, day and night, they never cease to say, <clears throat> holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. I mean, just imagine this, right? They, 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 they never cease to say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who is eternal, who was and is and is to come. And so what do they mean when they say, holy, holy, holy? What they mean is that God is absolutely, completely set apart. That, that there is no one like him, that, 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 that there's no blemishes, that, that there's no emperor or president that even comes close to comparing. Anyone else in all of the, uh, of the universe even comes close to comparing to what he is like, that he's uncontaminated by sin or by failure, that he's perfectly beautiful, that there's nothing in the universe that's more beautiful than him. This is, this is what John is trying to describe, that he is worthy to be praised. And then, and then he goes on, and, and these four living creatures say that he was and is and is to come, that he is eternal, that there's nothing bigger, there's nothing before him, there's nothing that will outlast him, there is no one that is more eternal than him. The, the Roman Empire is just a blink in God's eyes. This worship begins to prompt more worship. In verse 9 through 11, it says this. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, 
who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders, they fall down before him who is seated on the throne and they worship him who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne saying, worthy are you, worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. They're saying that he is worthy. Why is he worthy? Because he created all things. I mean, think about it. We, we admire the, the, these beautiful works of art and, and architecture and whatever it might be. Like we, we marvel at these beautiful works that human beings have, have made. But, but think about it. Nothing exists that God did not create. That he sat back in his lazy boy lounger one day and just sort of spoke it all into existence. The most beautiful scenery you could ever make was his idea that he is almighty creator God of heaven and earth. You see, as we begin, as we continue to go through these things, what I'd encourage you to do, if you haven't already, is take those things, those things in life that are weighing you down, those things that are weighing heavy on you, those things that, that give you a case of the look downs, and, and if you haven't done it yet, just sort of put them on the shelf. Just sort of put them on the shelf and allow your hearts and minds to, to see what it is that, that John is seeing. And so in chapter 5, it continues on, and, and a scroll enters the scene, and they're wondering who's worthy to, take, uh, to open this scroll. The scroll ends up having a lot of things that Matt's going to talk about next week in it, but, but it can, the worship continues in verse 9. It says this, they sang a new song. This is to Jesus now, saying, Worthy are you to take that scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. You see, this worship has to do with what Jesus did for us, that Jesus made the ultimate buyback ever in the history of the universe. Nothing is ever going to top it. He, he made, paid the ultimate ransom, the redemption for us by his blood. In doing that, he overcame evil, he conquered death, he, he set the captives free. You see, while Rome, while Rome was on a journey to go conquer new nations, and in so doing, they kept trophies from these other nations, they conquered these nations by shedding their blood. You see, here in contrast, we see that Jesus ransomed back people from every nation, every tribe, every tongue, not by shedding their blood, but by shedding his own blood. And that one day, one day every tongue and every tribe and every nation will be represented at the throne of God. Why? Because Jesus ransomed people for God by shedding his blood. You see, we have this progression of worship, and it's not over yet. You see, it continues. It started with the four living creatures, and it turned into the 24 elders joining them. And then it crescendos in verse 11. It says this, Then I looked, and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders and the voice of many angels numbering myriads and myriads and thousands of thousands. This is just John's way of saying I don't know how many there were. There were just like a bajillion angels around the throne. And, and, and it goes on to say this, saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb who is slain, worthy to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth, in the sea and all that is in them saying to him, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Be blessing and honor and glory and power forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen, and the elders fell down and they worshiped. Like just imagine this scene for a moment. Like imagine this scene for a moment that, that he is worthy of all of these things. Why? Because he lived the perfect life. Jesus was tempted with, yet without sin. He, was, he lived a humble life to the point of death. 
predicted his own death, burial, and resurrection, and then pulled it off. And now he's at the right hand of the Father, and he is worthy, and he is trustworthy. I mean, what an amazing sight we see here. You see, and if you can imagine what John is trying to, to do, if you can imagine what John is trying to explain here, like if you've ever been somewhere, been on a vacation where, where you experience something amazing and then you try to tell it to your friends and they're like, oh, that sounds cool, Chris, but they don't like actually understand, like this is what's going on. How does John, how does John describe infinite beauty in words? How does John describe infinite wisdom, infinite power Infinite awe. Like, how does he describe that? And he's, what he's trying to do is, is give us a vision of what's really happening. He's saying, look up, church. <laughs> like, look up. Like, this is what's real. This is what's really going on right now, and it's never going to end. That God is right now on the throne being worshipped, and that will never end. That he is above all things, that he is holding all things together, and that will never end. Oh my gosh, that we could see what's really happening. That we could lift our eyes out of all that's going on and see what's really happening. For just a moment, I want you to take that thing back off the shelf. What is that thing that gives you the case of the look downs? What is that thing that, that, that's maybe drawing your heart away? What is that thing that, that's taking up all of your time and energy and attention? What is that thing? You see, when we lose our job, we look down because we're like, how do we, how am I gonna provide? When we get that bad medical port, report, we look down. How am I gonna get through this? When we see the crazy world around us, we look down because we wonder, is it ever gonna get better? Well, when the economy struggles, with an upcoming election, when there's wars and rumors of wars, when, when the cancer uh, that they just found that we thought was gone is back, when, when that loved one dies, we look down, what do we, how are we going to get through this? And John's vision reminds us to look up. Do you see it? Do you see what's really going on? This isn't just here, but this is also what Paul says. If you remember Paul, who wrote the book of Colossians, he's, he tells them, hey, look up, look at the, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, where he's seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on those things. In fact, the way that the message translation says it, it says this, so if you're serious about living this new resurrection life with Christ, then act like it. Pursue those things. Pursue the things over which Christ presides. Don't, don't shuffle along, eyes to the ground, absorbed with the things right in front of you. But look up. Be alert to what is going on around Christ. That's where the action is. See things from his perspective. Man, church is... As we look up to really what's going on, we see that God is on the throne, that he's never ending. He wasn't shaken by Rome. He's not shaken by what's going on now. He's never surprised. He's never frantic. He's never wondering what he's going to do next, that he is completely at peace and sovereign over everything. He never got a case of the lookdowns. And when we see God as he really is, and when we see the universe as it really is, what happens is that there's a refocusing that happens, that our perspective changes from microscopic to the little, the things right around us in front of us to, to telescopic, that we look up, that we see the truth that he's never ending, that he's on the throne, that he always will be, that we gaze upon that beauty. And when we do, everything else seems to get smaller, doesn't it? Everything else that, that usually takes up our attention just seems to kind of fade. It might still be important, but maybe it's not that important. And we can shepherd our hearts back to worshiping him, crushing these idols, crushing our indifference, reigniting this passion in our hearts for who God is and what he's doing. When we worship him, it changes our life. 
when we truly worship him, it changes and reorders our life. Why would we trust in anything else? Here's the the truth, is that every single person on the face of the earth, whether they consider themselves religious or not, every single person worships something and trusts something. We don't have a choice. But what we do have a choice is who we're going to trust in and who we're going to worship. Are you tired of trusting in yourself? Are you tired of worshiping success? Are you tired of trusting in your health or whatever it might be? Man, turn back to Jesus. Set your hearts on him. Look up. Let's pray. Jesus, we come to you today and we acknowledge that our hearts are so easily turned astray from you. God, so many things, some of them really important things going on in our lives right now, and it's so easy for all of our focus, all of our attention to just shift. But God, here in these chapters, you give us a picture of reality, of what's really going on. Oh, that we would see what's really going on. God, we thank you that you are above all things. Thank you that you are above the God who was and is and is to come, that you are not shaken by anything, God. Would you draw our hearts? Would you woo us back to you? That you would reignite the passion in our hearts, Lord, to to love you and to, to follow you, to live for you, God. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. If you're at a place where you are wanting to follow Jesus, if you're wanting to put your trust and your worship in him instead of all these other things, man, we would love to just have a conversation with you. It it, it really is as simple as responding to an invitation, Jesus's invitation, which says, come to me. Come to me and lay down your burdens and I will give you a a new life, a new lightness. I will make you new. But man, we would love to come alongside you and pray with you, answer questions, talk about what it is that you are uh, deciding, okay? So you can text this number, text the name to this number, the name of Jesus, and we'll get back in touch with you. As we remember the sacrifice of Jesus today with the cup and the bread, we remember that his kingdom is the unstoppable, unshakable, undefeated kingdom. Not because of what we can do, not because of our own righteousness or holiness, but because of his righteousness and holiness given to us through the breaking of his body and the pouring out of his blood. And so today as we remember, we take the, bre- the, blood, uh, the bread and we remember his body given for us. Let's remember together. And the cup, which represents the blood of the eternal God, almighty creator, pouring out his own blood for you and for me. Let's remember together. Friends, we're going to spend some time together worshiping and responding to our great God, joining with this heavenly choir in singing to him. During this time, if you would like prayer, there's going to be people under the banner in the back who would love to pray with you, all right? Let's stand as we sing.